Yes, next panelist, Dr. Sergio Alcocer, researcher of UNAM Engineering Institute and engineer Ruben Bautista, who's a fellow for the Engineering Institute of the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Yes, Dr. Alcocer. Yes, thank you, thank you, Dr. Fernandez. And I will show the first slides and then Engineer Bautista will finish this presentation. This is a presentation that has to do with one of the lessons we were just uh, discussing with Dr. Maria about the accompaniment uh, with the World Bank and other institutions uh, after the 2017 earthquake. This has to do with the need of having the necessary, the need of having the methodology for education physical infrastructure. What we're trying to do with this, according to the integral management cycle, is to look into the reconstruction recovery. And of course, this happens, first of all, identifying the risks. And this happens exactly after an earthquake. And we have to attend to the needs of the victims of the affected population as soon as possible. We have to have an evaluation of the buildings, and this is level one buildings, and we are working with friends from Italy, the United States and other countries, and we are looking at each one of the stories, and this becomes an increasingly complex, a complex operation. And we have the recovery stage. There we have the evaluation to process to see which structures have to be retrofitted and which do not have to be retrofitted. We see that in level three, once we've decided the reconstruction of the structure or once we have decided what to do, we should have an assessment that we call it level three, which has to do with a seismic guide. And this is the next presentation. Next slide, please. Now let us look at this methodology to answer these questions. It is designed to be applied in level one, level two. The question is whether we can use the school as one of the three responses, yes, no, or doubts. If we put a green, red, or yellow. Whenever there are doubts, it is the yellow. When it's yes, it's the green one, and when it's no, it's the no card that we place. And this is the fast evaluation method right after the earthquake in immediate zones where the earthquake took place. And this is level two intermediate evaluation. And we're answering two questions. Uh, level one notice, is it confirmed? Yes or no? And the second one is structural retrofitting required or does the building have to be demolished? This is applied days after the occurrence of the earthquake. Uh, level one and level two should not be applied simultaneously. We tried to do it in Mexico City after the 2017 earthquake with uh, very poor results. And this is something we tried to do after the 2017 earthquakes with not very favorable results. This was mentioned by Dr. Muria. And exactly what we're looking for through this methodology, we have designed with INIFED, thanks to the support of INIFED and with the collaboration of many experts is to differentiate level one and level two. Once we've decided to do the retrofitting, then we do the profound or the deep evaluation process. And this takes place weeks or months after the occurrence of the earthquake. And we are going to be discussing this. And the methodology we've developed includes three documents that uh, Engineer Bautista will discuss. And uh, Later, I will talk about the technical guidelines. Please, uh, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, doctor. As the doctor said, we're going to talk about volume one, methodology of post-seismic evaluation. The main purpose is to describe the evaluation methodology after the earthquake and uh, the impact on educational 
facilities in Mexico to define the structural safety situation to harmonize damage classification because in past earthquakes we have seen this classification of the damage was not consistent. Sometimes we had reports that were not consistent with the type of damage of the structure. Therefore, since there were disagreements in the reports, we wanted to be as harmonized or homogeneous as possible for us to be clear on whether this is severe, moderate, and slight damage to contribute towards the inspection plan so that the system and the different organizations that are doing assessment of the damage may provide the necessary steps to recover those structures. Now, the content of this volume one has 15 chapters. I will talk about a few of them, chapter four, five, and six, which have to do with the methodology. As Dr. Sergio just said, number one, fast evaluation two. This is the intermediate evaluation that comes from level one. In this volume, we see the inspection that should be taking place in each one of the structures depending on the masonry, concrete, the different materials. And for that, we mention the different prototypes or construction systems for each one of those structures. The next three chapters talk about other hazards that should be considered. They're not structural, but they do constitute major damage or in risk for people who are going to be using those facilities. For instance, geotechnical hazard, non-structural hazard, materials that may come off the structures or uh, rots that may collapse. And this talks about hazardous materials and what to do with them in case this is happening in one of the structures. This flow chart tells us how the methodology will be implemented. It's level one, the broadest one. We do a uh, scanning of the structures exposed to this event. And thus, we shall know if the structures can be used or not. If there are any doubts, how are we going to go in there? The second level, number two, there we should confirm whether this use is permitted or not. And if we need retrofitting and the steps to look into this damaged, the damaged uh, structure. In case we do the retrofitting process, we go on to deep evaluation, level three. Yes. What about the evaluation? Which is the result of the evaluation? Thus, we decided to place this uh, cards or signs per building to say if anyone can access this structure or not access the structure. And there's another sign outside the school so that the parents and everyone interested in knowing what is the situation of the school structure may find out through these signs placed outside the schools according to the different color, which has to do with the type of damage in the school. Sometimes a map is also placed so that people know exactly which are the most hazardous or dangerous parts. This is the fast evaluation format through which we know the structural characteristics, location, geographic location, 
center working code and other structural data construction, type of structure, materials that were used for the construction, and whether this is going to be retrofitted or not. The next one there, you see damage characteristics, global damage, structural, and non-structural damage. For that, we have a classification of slight, moderate, and severe damage. After assessing the scope of the structure and non-structural part of all this, estimated global damage according to percentages for us to know and to assign the traffic light system we use green, red, and yellow, yellow one, yellow two, red one, red, uh, red uh, two, and the green one as well. For the intermediate classification, this is according to priority selection, capacity and demand for each one of the structures and other data mentioned on this methodology, especially for care level one and two. This is done through equations and the procedure and the methodology for us to know behavior of the elements, concrete, steel columns and beams, concrete or steel beams and slabs and masonry, uh, concrete or steel and other elements that should be taken into account to compare capacity versus demand. Here, you see some elements of the methodology. We have not included all of them because there are so many of them depending on the system we are evaluating. Now, to use these equations, we need reductive factors to give it a better classification for us to better classify capacity of the structures. And this is done through behavior modes and damage levels. As you can see for different damage levels, we have different reductive factors that will have an impact on the structure capacity. These chapters, chapters seven, eight, and nine have to do with inspections on the different structures. We have charts like the one on your screen, allowing us to know what it is that we have to look at in the structures to make sure we are doing the right survey of those structures. According to those charts, you see here, this is based on the charts that I just showed you. We wanted to make this more graphic so that you can understand the damage of those structures better. Now, this is the field manual, the purpose of which is to support authorities in charge of checking the education, physical infrastructure and civil protection to do the assessment after the emergency is declared because of an earthquake. This will be done a few hours later, as Dr. Alcocer said, a few hours after the emergency so that we can uh, promptly attend to the needs of the emergency. The characteristics is that uh, this document does not replace volume one. This is just support material condensating everything we saw in the previous document on methodology for number one level. This is a very kind document because it's user-friendly. You see the different colorings uh, here, the different colors for a very fast and quick consultation process of the different chapters. You see they are similar to the ones we saw a few minutes ago in volume one. Now, as you can see here, this volume has a big advantage. It is more graphic with more images and it better explains what should be done out in the field. And we can consult it immediately. 
this document is volume two is introduction of seismic behavior for evaluation purposes this is a complementary document it complements volume one the objective is for the evaluators to have the necessary information harmonized information so that they can do the right inspection and evaluation of the buildings in a very uniform fashion without omitting necessary steps in the evaluation process so that we can have homogeneous results. Now, the content of this document has 10 chapters. In this chapter, we can see properties of that are necessary <clears throat> to determine the behavior of the structures in the case of earthquakes, such as resistance, ductility, among other characteristics of structures. The following chapter shows the characteristics that are disadvantages for these structures like architectural features or construction features. In this chapter, we show several images of what must not be done in order to have good structural performance. The next chapter is the deterioration of structural features. And here we discuss these deterioration and what must be done. The following four chapters mention the behavior and performance of structures depending on its construction material. In the following slide, I will show you some images that will tell us about this performance. And this will help us understand better how each one of these structures perform. Finally, in chapter 10, we have failures and dangers in these structures after earthquakes. As we can see here in table 7.1, we talk about reinforced concrete frames and we have a compilation of structures that use this structural system where we also describe the possible damage that these structures can have after an earthquake. We see it here, the way this was mentioned, you see some illustrations right here on how this behavior can take place. This is for each one of the construction systems, but this has to do with masonry in the different structural systems. Finally, we have the technical calibration, and this is to see if this is possible or not. And this is then, these are then the three documents. Que, que debemos de tener después de que ya tenemos esta, esta metodología hecha, pues es talleres de capacitación para que las personas, eh, los evaluadores en específico, sepan de forma correcta cómo es que se va a aplicar esta metodología y que sepan a ciencia cierta qué, qué y qué no se debe de hacer en las estructuras para que tenga, se familiaricen un poco más con este documento. Eh, se deben de, de proponer estrategias de comunicación y vinculación con los distintos eh, interesados eh, en la seguridad de, de, las, de las escuelas, esto con el fin de que todos eh, caminen hacia el mismo objetivo, que es la seguridad estructural de, de las escuelas, para que se puedan ocupar de la mejor forma. Eh, se debe de tener un sistema de seguimiento de los proyectos, ya que como comentó el doctor David Muria en, en, su, en, en, la, en la anterior eh, de presentación, a veces se, se da el proyecto, pero no se da un seguimiento de cómo es que se debe de, de realizar esto, y a veces tenemos algunas deficiencias, como lo, lo comentó el, el doctor David, eh, en, en la ejecución del proyecto. Finalmente, se propone que aunado a estas guías y manuales para la evaluación estructural, se creen guías y manuales para los padres de familia, para que ellos también conozcan los alcances de este proyecto, para, involuc para involucrarlos de manera que puedan ver cómo se va a hacer esto, pero no en su construcción.
Eh, se debe de, de generar también eh, guías y manuales del, 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 del mantenimiento y la conservación de la infraestructura educativa, ya que a veces esto es un tema que no se, no se menciona eh, tan a detalle y es un tema muy importante en el desempeño de las estructuras ante sismos. Finalmente, quiero agradecer a todos los colaboradores que hemos estado haciendo este proyecto. Eh, como pueden ver, es una gran cantidad de compañeros y, y de y de personas que están involucrados, principalmente pues dar las gracias al doctor Sergio, que es el, el coordinador, y al doctor David, que es el coordinador, y pues todos nosotros que estamos colaborando en este proyecto. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, ingeniero Bautista. Muchas gracias, doctor Alcocer. Tenemos eh, unos minutos para algunas eh, preguntas y, y comentarios. We have bueno, some questions, some comments. The main question is whether these documents are already published and where can they get them? Can you please comment about that? Of course, we are going to present these documents formally in the closing session and you can find them in the INIFED website and another UNAM website so you can download these three documents that men were mentioned by Ruben and the fourth one that I will present in a few minutes they will be available starting tomorrow and some of them can already be checked at resiliencia-sismica.unam.mx but we will formally present them tomorrow. Thank you, doctor. There's another question that relates to the previous presentation and yours, referring to the fact that many of the problems relate to the quality of construction residents, which are the ones that supervise the construction. And they ask whether these residents from construction companies ought to be any type of certified uh, person. This is a very interesting question. Our construction residents, not just in construction for education, but any type of construction, are more trained in administrative affairs than anything else, relegating the quality of the construction to masons and the construction team. This, without a doubt, is a deficient practice. We should make it possible for our residents to be A, better trained technically, and B, to have someone else for administrative issues so they can ensure that material quality, the use of materials, and construction issues to be carried out in the way it is stated in manuals. Uh, if we don't accomplish this, we will have the possibility of not having high quality buildings. We must also think about technical supervision that is complementary to these Course of the size and type of structure. Trained supervision, not in administrative affairs, but in technical matters. So we can ensure the proper use of materials and the proper application of construction blueprints. This doesn't just impact schools, but all of the construction industry in Mexico. And this is something that we need to address to better training. And another important thing is to train the personnel of the construction industry, uh, brick, uh, masons and bricklayers, to raise awareness about the importance of their job and the importance that their work has in the face of an earthquake. Thank you, doctor. And one quick uh, question for engineer 
Can this be done? Can these methods only apply to historical buildings? Yes, this methodology can be used in any type of structure, as we were able to see. We cover different structural systems. Of course, in this one, we focused, we focused on school buildings, but the great advantage is that this methodology can be applied to any structure. Thank you, engineer, and thank you for participating as well, Dr. Sergio Alcocer.